Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and get ready, we're going deep undercover, and I'm not talking about hitting the snooze button again. Today, we're going to dig in on what's holding you back in life so you can take control of your money. Nothing's holding me back except Joe's mom. Man, she's tougher than a pair of dull fingernail clippers at Meemaw's toenail cutting party. Well, here to show us how to sneak past our money roadblocks, say hello to former Mossad agent Itamar Marani. For our TikTok Minute, we'll discuss some prudent 401k planning. In our headlines, Alan Corey from Stacking Deeds joins us to chat about potential big problems for some real estate investors. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to stacker Greg, who wants to know the best place to save for a home. How about my checking account, Greg? And then I'll share some thrilling trivia. And now, two guys who eat mindset and tricks for breakfast. It's Joe and O J J J J G. It's a great one, two punch, Doug. First the mindset, then the tricks. They go in, and this podcast pops out. Hey, everybody! Happy Monday to all of you, and the guy who also eats mindset for breakfast. Mr. OG across the card table from me. How are you, man? What's up? Good morning. I am super happy to be here. Doug, good morning to you, my friend. Bright and chipper this morning, Joe. Unlike some people here in the basement. Well, are you talking? Don't talk about our guests that way. We've got Alan Corey from Stacking Deeds, and he seems to be in a fine mood today. I'm always in a good mood, Doug. I, I, I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, Joe maybe came in a little hot but pre-recording. But, uh, yeah, we're all we're <laughs> in a good place now. Why are you pointing the finger at me when it's the two of you going on and on? I got no idea what's going on uh -uh. here. Yeah. We got a great – well, watch out because I have a better relationship with Itamar Marani than either of you guys do. And he is former special forces Former Mossad agent, people don't know Mossad, uh, you might want to look that up. That's Israeli secret agent. We'll be able to neither confirm nor deny that he's here if it gets uh, if it gets too rough. So you can literally say you know a guy. <laughs> I might know a guy. I know a thing. guy. I, there's question yes. marks really around where you said you know him pretty well. Is, is he investigating you for something? No. I think we got to move on Ooh. on that. Do we think this is his real name? <laughs> is this just a cover? <laughs> Would you go with Itamar Marani? I used to uh, work with a guy when I was uh, giving speeches for American Express. His name was Tom Smith, and he would always begin his speeches with, Hi, I'm Tom Smith. Yes, that is my real name. And he'd begin every speech that way. I'm sure Itamar begins his speeches that way, too. I'm Itamar Marani, and yes, that is, that is my name. we got a great show today, by the way. We've got uh, not only Itamar here with some fantastic tips about mindset. If anybody knows about mindset... It's a guy who's been special forces and a secret agent and now counsels CEOs and heads of companies and entrepreneurs how to get more by breaking through those walls. We all put ourselves, we all put ourselves behind these walls when it comes to investing. But first, we got Mr. Corey here for a big real estate headline. Alec Corey's here. Itamar Marani's here. OG and Doug. So let's get playing. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. This is uh, written by three writers, Will Parker, Conrad Putzier, and Shane Shiflett. A housing bust comes for thousands of small-time investors. Let's dig into this. The triumvirate of Wall Street Journal writes, few investors rode the pandemic-era housing boom as high as Jay Gagevelli. Fewer still have fallen as far. Before Gajavelli found his real estate career, the 61-year-old immigrant from India was just another information technology worker putting in 60-hour weeks for a middling job in Dallas. Last year, Gajavelli's company owned more than $500 million worth of Sunbelt apartment buildings with more than 7,000 units. It was one of Houston's biggest landlords. Well, over the past four years, Gajavelli built his real estate empire using funds from dozens of small investors who wanted a chance 
to earn a landlord's riches without any of the work. He pitched double your money returns in ebullient can-do talks and investor conferences and on YouTube videos. Let's talk about what's going on. We talk about dozens of investors putting money in these things. This is what I think, Alan, is called a syndicate or syndication. Can you talk about how this works for a moment? Yeah, sure. It's someone basically raising funds from passive investors to go invest it in real estate. And this is honestly the majority of commercial deals, which are five units or more, residentially speaking, uh, like in this case, where you're talking tens, twenties, he's got 500 million. Most people don't have that money to do this all by themselves. So they identify the deal and then they go identify investors to invest in that deal. And they basically are, you know, fundraising is the syndication aspect of it. A lot of people, OG, think of this then as a mutual fund, right? My money goes in with a bunch of other investors, so I'm diversifying the risk over a lot of people. But that analogy might not be correct here. I think the biggest difference is that there's not as much you know, financial oversight or regulatory oversight for that type of investing. I mean, just listening to some things like, quote, double your money, right? Like, there's no way in the real investing world that you could stand on a stage and tell people that you're going to double their money and not have the SEC come, come knocking on your door going, ahem, a word, please, sir. You know, because that's just not anything that you can do. But, but in that kind of private, <laughs> dare I say, back alley way of raising money, you can say and do whatever you want to do without a lot of oversight. And unfortunately, just like there's, you know, plenty of people who do it the right way, there's going to be some some unfortunate kind of bad actors I, along the way. I, I'll, I'll jump in. There, there's, there's no diversity at, at all in diversification because you're putting all your money into one project. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. These went into one apartment building, right? Each He was selling one apartment building as a separate syndication yeah. is my understanding. Complex. One apartment complex. Yeah. Gajavelli described buying buildings with plans to upgrade units, raise rents, and sell for a profit after as little as three years. That all sounds great. The idea that everybody needs a place to live was the bedrock of Gajavelli's pitch. The Wall Street Journal says... God's not making any more land. I haven't heard that <laughs> oh, story no, no, no. before. No, listen better. I never worry about the economy now, Gajavelli told investors in a webinar presentation last year. Even if the economy goes down, still I make money. Well, here's the thing. In a rising interest rate environment, we find that, the, that uh, some of the commercial loans apparently that he had that were at variable rates. And Alan, if you're mortgages are at a variable rate, his whole pitch is wrong. He's got to worry about the economy because his monthly number he's got to beat gets higher. Over and over again, the downfall of real estate investing is that variable rate. That was the financial crash and, and more. So unfortunately, that is how a lot of commercial deals, you have no option but variable rate because the sales pitch, the, the business plan, the financial modeling is let's buy this property on a short-term, one-year, two-year arm, adjustable rate mortgage, let's renovate the building. And then once it's stabilized, we do a, more of a fixed or a longer term. And that is just how this business works, but that is the risk. That's the risk there. And it comes back to, if you're investing in something, all the money that you invest should be earmarked that you may lose it. It's not a sure thing. No investment is a sure thing. Did this thing. guy do anything right? I mean, he's not only is he in one asset class, he's in one apartment complex. Did it even have like oh, a no, workout he's in... room and a pool? <laughs> <laughs> Doug, he's actually in several different apartment buildings. Tons of apartment complexes. Yeah, but each, com oh, okay. each complex, my understanding, Alan, is each complex is a different syndicate, right? That's right. So it could be the same investors, but typically he's probably going to have different investors. So let's say he's got, he said, the article says he's got 500 million. I would, you know, maybe he's got 10 different apartment complexes that are 50 million each. And then he has to raise money and has a plan. To me, just from the outside looking in, I don't, I don't have any inside knowledge here. He probably bit off more than he could chew because with this variable interest rate, it's all about speed. How fast can I get in, renovate the properties, get them filled up, change over the leases, whatever the business plan was, it's all about speed. But if you're doing that many properties at the same time and you're a one-man show, uh, you're just going to run out of time. Just to give people an idea of how bad this has gotten for Gajavelli and his investors, he had 7,000 units before he's lost, as of the time of this writing, according to the Wall Street Journal, he's lost more than 3,000 of the 7,000 to foreclosure. Let's start off here, OG. This idea at the top of this piece that really raises a red flag for me. He lures in investors who want to do none of the work and get these huge returns. Well, you know, with any sort of, whether it's syndication deal or capital raise deal, I was pitched a couple of weeks ago about a project in Kentucky that revolved around bourbon. 
they're like, I'm in. that dude seems to be uh, a connoisseur, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> but all of these private equity deals, whether it's a real estate syndication or it's a bourbon manufacturing operation or you know, an ice cream shop in northern Michigan, they all revolve around assumptions. And they all re revolve around somebody's projection that this is how the plan's going to go. This is how we're going to do it. I need to get all this capital to make it happen because, like Alan said, few people have half a billion dollars lying around to go buy up a whole bunch of apartment buildings. And so all of that is predicated on all of these things happening exactly the way that we project. And if that happens, then here's what's going to happen with your money. But the interesting thing on the front end of that for all of those deals is that generally the person who finds the deal gets a little bit of money up front, right? There was an article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago about the special purpose acquisition companies. Remember those from a year ago, the SPACs? And all the people who started the SPACs pulled out $22 billion of profit. Meanwhile, the people who own the SPAC still don't have any profit because all of those, you know, went kind of belly up. And so like those and like this deal and like other deals, the people who identify it get paid up front. And so when, when you're looking at a deal, you're looking at something that's like, hey, I've raised a half a billion dollars and the finder's fee is 5% or 2%. I'm doing pretty good just by getting a whole bunch of people in a room to write checks for 50 grand. You know, that's a pretty good use of my time for, you know, if I'm the money raise guy. And Alan, like you said, you bite off a little bit more than you can chew. And all of a sudden you go, huh, well, that didn't work. Sorry about that, guys. Anyway, we got a new deal coming if anybody's interested. <laughs> my bad. That one's on me. That one's on me, coach. I like this idea, OG, of challenging the assumptions, right? They all come with assumptions. They have to come with yeah. assumptions. This is a forward vet. So what are the assumptions and question those? But Alan, specifically with these real estate syndications, what are some other questions I should be asking before I invest in a syndication? The best way I've heard it explained is that when you're investing, you're betting on the horse, but you're also betting on the jockey. So the horse is the deal itself. Like, do you think that these apartments can rent for what they say they will once they renovate? And yeah, you're not the expert, but maybe you can do a quick Zillow search and seeing what apartments are renting for. That's betting on the horse, like the, the actual deal. And then you're betting on the jockey, and that's the person who's running the deal. So the, the man in this article who raised the money, who's making the decisions, who's hiring the contractors, who's getting the financing, that's the jockey, the guy running the deal. So you're also making a bet on them. So you have to kind of combine the two and understand what you're investing in. It is meant to be passive. All these private equity deals, like OG was saying, it's purposeful to be passive. And then that's why it exists. And, and there's a business for it. It's just like if I was going to be an angel investor in a tech startup, I'm passive. I don't make any decisions, uh, but I like the idea. I like the team that's in place. I like their vision. That's me betting on the horse and the jockey. This is the exact same thing. So if you do want to diversify in this, I would bet on different horses and different jockeys. And it seems like a lot of these people who lost a lot of money, they put all their money on the same jockey over and over again. And then when that jockey didn't work out, well, all the horses didn't work out. Well, I think about Alan, this particular jockey, this guy, it says, right in the piece just a couple of years ago, he's just a mid-level IT guy and he goes out and buys 7,000. He has no track record. I mean, this, this particular jockey's got nothing except for a ton of buildings he's built over the span of just the last couple of years. Yeah. I mean, I've done syndications and I've raised money. And to be honest, I would not even feel comfortable asking for money for something I've never done before. Uh, you know, and it, it's one of those things where if this is, oh, Doug, you know, let him spit his Doug own money. Asked, yeah. Doug asks for money for things he's never done before all the time. He doesn't, he doesn't <laughs> yeah. usually get it, but he asks <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> well, you know, he, Glasses half full. But yeah, it's one of those things that's betting on the jockey, right? Like, why would I give $70,000 to someone and this is their first apartment building that they're going to flip? It's why don't you go do it, get some experience, and then I'll, I'll you know, come back to me. And so the, if you want longevity in this business as a syndicator, it's all about your track record. Because if you lose someone's money, it's going to be very, very difficult to raise money again. And so it's all about the team you have in place, all the experience, because you're only as good as your last deal. Why do I feel like this is all all one big lead up to a intervention and you guys telling me you're not giving me the money that I was wanting to invest? <laughs> Maybe that's at the end right after yeah. we finish the recording, OG. Yeah, I was just going to say the uh, the only problem with that is that there's no ongoing record keeping. I mean, other than a Google search, right? I mean, I could Google Joe Blow and find out that he's been sued for this or something like that. But I mean, we hear about these stories a lot of the financial kind of shenanigans that happen and there's smoke there a lot where you can go well obviously if you looked you would have seen this but most people don't 
and even if you do, you, you know, a, a really successful salesperson can kind of overcome a lot of those things. Like, well, yeah, that was during the rising market, you know, you, you know, that sort of thing. I think what you said before, Alan, is kind of the most important piece out of all of this is that when you're investing in something that's very particular and it's very, very, very high return potential, you know, think about that from a variability standpoint. The reason that you don't get double your money in your bank over the course of three years is because it's guaranteed to be there when you need it. And if you're investing in something that the projections are, and then I'll double your money in three years, that's one side of that, you know, variation. That's one side of that variability. The other side of the variability is, or it'll be worth zero. We just have to accept that those are the two numbers. And, you know, sometimes the private equity deals or syndication deals work out and maybe even, maybe even most of the time they work out. But you always have to remember that when you're investing in something that's very specialized and very uh, uh, high volatility, we always get you know lured in by the high volatility on the upside. You know, if I'd have just invested all my money in Nvidia options three weeks ago, I'd be a gazillionaire. Yes, true. Except for the fact that the alternative to that is zero. There's there was no like, well, I might just average eight a year for the next twenty years and it'll be okay, because that's not sexy. So if you're going to go down the path of something really, really high, high volatility, high return potential, you got to accept the fact that this might be zero on the back end. And I think I think that's what you're Well, let me throw about. fuel in that fire. Sometimes if things are going poorly, there's a capital raise and then they go back to their investors and they ask for more money to keep the project oh, yeah. afloat. I've seen so, that. Uh, I've seen that. If, so that's something it I would go worse than zero. Yeah, it can go worse than zero. Yeah, can go worse, it can go worse than zero. It can be worse than that. Munzer Hack, a former IT professional in Plano, Texas, uh, the Wall Street Journal writes, said he was Appleway's largest individual investor in the company's four foreclosed properties. And in two others, he described as in trouble. Hack said he and his wife, both in their 60s, lost millions of dollars, the majority of their life savings. Ugh. It just. Yeah, that's painful. Uh, yeah, I would. Yeah, I would only put the majority of my life savings in something that you're running point on. You're, you're just it's just too much trust to, to put that into someone else. <laughs> Alan, I know there's there are a bunch of syndicates out there that have decent track records and can do the types of things people want them to do. But I think there's a lot of due diligence that these people clearly didn't do here. Yeah. And that's a lot of the gotcha investment strategies. And it's talking to other investors and just sort of confirming, fact checking. And it's worth hiring a consultant and saying, can you just look at these projections? I'll pay you 150 bucks for an hour to just review this to make sure that this is legit before I put in, you know, $50,000. So I think that's money well spent. There's a good podcast on this topic called Stacking Deeds, our sister podcast that Alan is the co-host with, along with our friend Crystal Hammond. Alan, I remember on episode one, you talked about the dangers of adjustable rate mortgages right on episode one, and we see it in action right here. What's coming up on Stacking Deeds? Actually, coming up in tomorrow's episode on Stacking Deeds, we have Dr. Chow, who is a Airbnb sublease wizard. What I mean by that, he actually doesn't own any property. He leases property, and then he subleases them uh, for midterm rentals and short-term rentals. And he's created quite an income without owning any real estate. So it's something we're digging into, and it's it's a really interesting story. That's fabulous. And that's tomorrow on the Stacking Deeds podcast, where we're listening to us now. Thanks for helping us on this one, Mr. Corey. I appreciate your time, my friend. It's been a blast. Thanks for having me. Let's dive into the TikTok Minute. This is the part of the show where we look at some amazing stuff happening on the internet, either amazing in air quotes or amazing as in really incredibly brilliant. Doug, we know what OG is already going to say. So uh, what are you thinking on this one, man? I'm a bit more of a wild card, Joe. So I think I'm going to go, uh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go the, the way that you think I'm going to go. I'm going OG's route on this. I'm thinking this one's hashtag ah. air quotes, whatever, not really like italics brilliant. I think that's the uh, understatement of the year, don't you, OG, when he says he's a he's a wild card? Oh, I'm a wild card. <laughs> to last, I think Wacky. we got 13 years proven he's a wild card right there. Uh, let's listen in. This is a gentleman talking about your 401k. Let's hear what he has to say, because apparently, OG, there may be some problems with your 401k. 401k facts. Most financial advisors would recommend you only take 35 to 4% max annual income out of your 401k to live on. Remember, your 401k is subject to market losses. So when the market does dip below whatever your 401k is now, your income goes with it. Are you prepared to cover the income loss in your retirement? I know I'm not. 
The great news, there's a better way. So what if you could take 6% annual income, be protected from market losses while only participating in market gains? <laughs> Not only are you protected from market losses, but you can take 6% a year and still grow your principal balance. That's crazy. Who wouldn't want more money in retirement with a guarantee of not losing money due to market corrections? So listen, if you're like me, want and need as much money in your retirement as you can get, click the learn more button to get started. More money, less. Uh, I'm not going to click the learn more button. Let's learn more button by clicking the OG button. What's going on here, man? First of all, is it true that experts say that we should only take 4% out of our 401k? Well, I mean, it's based on some math. You know, and math is kind of these, uh, this really fickle thing that requires you to use data and uh, make decisions based on the data outputs. Is it true that if I have to leave, you answered the question, is it true that if I leave my money in my 401k and the market goes down and I'm taking out 4%, well, then I have to be prepared to maybe live on less if my money's still in that 401k? Well, the 4% thing is really based on the initial draw plus inflation from that point forward. So if you have a balance of a million dollars and in year one, you take 40,000 and the market goes down year two, you take 40,000 plus inflation. So that's how it was originally designed. So that's false. That would be false. And then the rest of it, I think it's a little more false from there. It's also gigantic. <laughs> yes. I mean, basically he what he's talking us, yeah. about is a, yeah, what he's talking about here is an index annuity that has a guaranteed withdrawal benefit rider attached to it, which, you know, I mean, hey, it provides income. He's not wrong about that. And it provides income based on the high watermark. So you put in a million bucks, you're going to get 60,000 out. But the return is capped, generally speaking, and also capped on the downside. So you're not going to get the negatives, but you're not going to get all of the positives either. Because you're taking out so much money, the only way the income continues to grow is if your balance grows, right? So if you have a million dollars and you take out 6%, you've taken out 60K, you're at 940. So what does the market have to grow by to get higher than a million dollars? It's more than 6%, right? It's got to grow at a, at, at, a, at a rate greater than that to get, you know, because whatever. Anyway, and then they cap it. So if the market goes up 30%, they go, yeah, cool. You don't get 30, you get 10 and so there's kind of a gimme and a gotcha there. So what really happens in practicality is that you stay at that 6% number, whatever that dollar amount is, that's the number you have for the rest of your life, which the downside, of course, is inflation. So you very comfortably get used to $5,000 a month on your million dollar plan. And in uh, 25 years from now, when that $5,000 a month is worth half as what, what it is today, just based on trend line inflation, then you're just in as much of a world of hurt. And then what happens in reality is that people take extra money out. They say, well, I know my balance has gone down because I've taken you know 60,000 out for 20 years, but I need some more today because 60 isn't getting me where I need to go. So I need to take an extra 25. Eep. Can't do it. And then my 60 becomes 55 the next year because I've made adjustments. So again, back to this, the only thing that you can do in retirement to outpace inflation is own things that outpace inflation. There is no other alternative to that. That you, there, there's no secret sauce. There's no silver bullet. There's no magic carpet ride. It's only you can own the things that outpace inflation. The only things that outpace inflation are the earnings of the biggest companies in the world. Period. Full stop. So if you want to outpace inflation, you have to own those things that do that. Because in 25 years from now, you need to have your income continue to rise, and um, and not in this and you know other things that that suggests that you have to be conservative at retirement, all that other sort of nonsense, make it so that you don't have a rising income, which would be detrimental. It's so frustrating to hear him say words like participate in the up with none of the down. You get to participate. Not even. You don't get it. Oh, you're participating. <laughs> yes. That word is chosen very carefully. Very, very, very carefully. Listen, here's the average return. If you're going to buy an index annuity, you should think of it as a fixed income component of your portfolio not an equity component of your portfolio. There's nothing wrong with them, you know, because they have a, it's an arrow in the quiver. There's a use case for index annuities, but the return you should be projecting in your plan is not market returns, not even close. You need to be projecting that there are the three to 4% returns. That's the historical return. And, and the income is nice. There's no doubt about it. And the guaranteed income uh, based on the insurance company still being around is, it's a nice way to supplement your, your retirement plan for sure. 
but I'm not sure that I would put all of my, like we were talking about before with syndications, I don't know that I'd put all my eggs in that basket either, you know, because you have to have a way to raise your income as you go through life. And this is not a tool to do that. We will dive more into annuities. I know we spoke about annuities last Wednesday. Kevin Bailey, though, our writer of the 201, had a much uh, deserved week off last week. So we had a special edition of the 201 newsletter this week. Tomorrow, we're going to dive into all things annuities. So if you're interested, wondering, I had a family member, OG, just this weekend, reach out to me and ask, so what do you think about annuities? And I said, yeah, we just had Rick Edelman on and here's his credentials. And he said, uh, yeah, it hasn't changed. We all hoped it would have changed the last 10 years For sure, ago. maybe, perhaps, no. Probably, sadly, not. And she had, by the way, been fed the half-truths, not the reasons why, as you stated, they might be useful, all the reasons that are just garbage to put these in your portfolio. Oh, it's all based on fear and panic. And, and, if you look at the, and if you look at the data, the amount of money that's gone into fixed index annuities in the last year is a record amount. Skyrocket. And all of the ads on TV are pitching this, hey, are you ticked off that your, mar- that your account went down 22% last year? da 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 guess what? If you buy this thing, it'll never go down. It'll always be the same amount every year. And it's like, I don't, I, it's not the down. It's not the once every so yeah. often down that scares me. It's the never going up again that scares me. <laughs> that should be what <laughs> like, scares you. Like that's the scary part, right? The scary part is that you never go up ever again. I mean, despite what Doug says, he's got the pills for that. <laughs> There's no pills for this. My, my relative used the word that they use being the salespeople, these high commission salespeople use OG gambling. You don't want to gamble. Don't gamble. I don't want to gamble with my retirement. Don't gamble. Yes. Yeah. Owning the biggest companies in the universe that make all the products that you use every single day. Sure sounds like gambling to me. In a diversified manner so that I'm buying the entire economy that needs to continue if we're all going to live. Boy. Hey, uh, coming up next, I'm super happy that we have this uh, former spy and ex-Israeli special forces. Uh, he was the youngest federal agent and air marshal in Israel's history. He's a Brazilian zoo. <laughs> yes, he was. A Brazilian. He's a Brazilianaire. He's a Brazilianaire. <laughs> Easy for me to say. I had that procedure done once. He's, <laughs> he's a Brazilian jiu jitsu black belt, ranked top 10 in the world at the amateur level, managed multinational SEAL teams and nine figure assets. He is a mindset coach now to founders, CEOs, and well, people like a lot of. Our stackers. He is a mindset accelerator. We're going to glean from him as much as we can and maybe hear a couple stories about what it's like to stack your Benjamins being a spy. Pretty amazing. Itamar Marani is next, but Doug, what do you got to get us there, man? You, you've, you've got a mission of your own? Oh, I am getting ready to set off on a mission. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I am setting off on a covert operation of my own. I'm sick of Joe's mom being the self-appointed cookie gatekeeper, so I'm sneaking into the kitchen to nab her super secret recipe. No more wielding those cookie powers over me, devil baker lady. Here's the setup. I just requested that we spend quality time together, you know, laughing and baking, lulling her into a false sense of security, and then I can grab the file, snap a quick photo using my secret lapel pin camera, and sharing the goodness. <laughs> so far, so good. She's on board and already asking me to wash, peel, and cut some carrots. Speaking of devilishly handsome secret agents doing work, like this guy, James Bond films made spy life look good. Since 1962, there have been 26 007 movies with seven different actors, but only one movie that brought in the huge Benjamins by making more than $1 billion worldwide. So that's today's trivia question. Which James Bond movie is the highest grossing of all time? I'll be back right after I pretend like I'm asking Joe's mom if I can lick the spoon when we're done. It's so on brand, me calling dibs early. She'll never suspect a thing. Hey there, stackers. I'm Martini Shaker and not so secret agent Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And here's your post commercial update. I finished the carrots during the break and she doesn't suspect a thing. I told her she looks great in her new Harley themed apron and she told me we could spend more quality time with me cleaning up the celery. And more proof that she has no clue, she said that when I'm finished with that, get this, I can clean the cupboard right next to the recipe. I may have a new career waiting for me, people. 
Maybe I'll chat about breaking into the secret agent biz with Itamar when Joe's finished. I gotta get back to the celery. But did you figure out my trivia question? Which James Bond movie was the highest grossing movie earning $1 billion worldwide? The answer is Skyfall with Daniel Craig playing 007. The movie earned $1.2 billion, nearly as much as I'm gonna make when I sell this recipe to the Food Network. And now, here to help us get past roadblocks and what's holding us back in life, former secret agent, Itamar Morani. Well, and I'm so happy he's here with me and a little nervous having a secret agent, former secret agent here with me. Itamar, Itamar Morani's here. How are you? I'm good, Joe. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Well, how does a guy end up as a secret agent? Like, I'm imagining you're just at a cafe somewhere. Somebody's been following you around and then they take you into the restroom and, I don't know, take you off to some secret headquarters where you find out that you've been uh, you've been now transformed into this super secret agent. That's probably not true. <laughs> that would be much easier than the route I had to take <laughs> if it could just have been transformed. <laughs> So my route, I was in the special forces back home in Israel. Honestly, I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder left after the special forces because I suffered some injuries and had a little bit of setbacks there. And I wasn't super content with finishing my service like that. And I knew about the Shabak, the Shin Bet, which is our undercover program. It's kind of like a hybrid between the CIA and the FBI. Yeah. And it was something that I still wanted to do. I wanted to still prove to myself that I was capable of more than what that injury let's say reduced me to at that well, point. Well, so wait a minute, just a second. Join... You, you were almost done. I just want to stop you for a second. You were almost done with your service commitment when, when this happened, like you, you could have been off and into civilian life. Yeah, I could have, but I was, I was going to go to officer school. I was supposed to go to officer school, basically our version of West Point. Yeah. And then I elected not to, because I recognized I couldn't do a certain role that I wanted to inside the unit because of that injury. It was just take too long to heal. So I took a little bit of time off, but then Two months after I was released, after the three-year service in the Special Forces, then I went into the GR program, the Shabak. And that is very much the opposite of just transformation. It's a 10-week program. It's extremely grueling of nonstop Krav Maga, shooting drills, tactical drills, uh, physical exertion. It was a very, very tough program that was only open to ex-Israeli Special Forces. And when you graduate that, if you graduate that, then you're certified as an agent. Most of our listeners are familiar with, with SEAL training, with Green Beret training, Ranger training. I would imagine it compares very much to a SEAL training program. Yes and no. So it's interesting. So their assumption, what they told us in the first day of that program, was you guys are all ex-Israeli special force. You guys are all special forces here. So that means you've already gone through something like BUDS, like the SEAL training. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. we're not here to actually see if you have what it takes. We're just here to train you in these specific elements. Now, if you can't match the requirements for these elements of combat, stealth, whatever it may be, then you're not a fit here. But we're not actually going to test your character because your character has already been vetted through the units you've all been in. So it's a bit different. Gotcha. It's a, it's a little bit, I would imagine, more intense and more cerebral. In fact, you say that what you learned there yeah. when you and I were writing back and forth before this, that uh, they don't focus on motivation. Like our average stacker... Itamar, they, they focus on trying to be motivated. They get up and try to get themselves motivated. You say that the special forces program does not focus on motivation at all. Yeah. So what was interesting to me, so I had a big situation when I was working at the agency, when I was working undercover in Mumbai, India. To make a long story short, someone who I thought was a friend that was in the local gold's gym there, so just an acquaintance, turned out to be an Al-Qaeda operative that was trying to kidnap me. Wow. That left me with some PTSD. And that got me in touch with the head of psychology of the Mossad to work together around that. And what was very fascinating to me about how he started to work with me about getting me back to, let's call it peak performance, it wasn't about motivating me or figuring out a way how to break through certain things or overpower them. He was just saying, instead of you trying to exert more effort, let's reduce the internal friction that you have around this. Because mm. if we can reduce that down, then you don't actually have to be motivated to take action. It creates a much more sustainable system. And it was such a fascinating thing because I definitely did not expect that I was going to talk about. He's like, let's just talk about what fears you have here, what the beliefs you have of how the world works that are causing you to feel like you have to get really motivated in order to take a simple action. Because if you can remove that friction, you won't actually need to get that motivated. And therefore, you can just take it on a consistent basis. It's not going to feel as difficult. And to me, that was, that was fascinating. It seems like you're working on a much deeper level. And, and I, I mean, motivation is one thing, but removing the friction is working on a deeper level. Yeah, I think motivation is a fallacy. It doesn't last. 
Like we've all been there where you read the inspirational book, you go to the conference, you listen to the TED talk, whatever it may be. And that motivation, it might last a day, a week, even a month, but eventually it fades. And then you go back into the old habits that don't serve you. So if instead of trying to hack this action equation of the level of motivation I have minus the level of friction, I can actually take action. If you just hack at the actual resistance and get down to near zero, even if you're not very motivated, you can still take a lot of action, a lot of positive action. And I think that's the key. It's the, the best analogy I've heard is instead of trying to press hard on the gas pedal, what if you put the handbrake down and put effort on doing that? Yeah. You know, you uh, now run a consulting agency working with CEOs, high powered people on eliminating some of that friction. What's the friction you see the most? Do you tend to see the same friction over and over and over? It's a great question. Um, I think this, the friction I see the most is a sense of internal frustration of why can't I do the thing that I know logically I should be doing? And it's a blind spot that they're having some kind of emotional reaction. They have a logical blueprint blueprint, sorry, of what they're supposed to be doing, but for some reason they're not doing it. And when I point out, oh, you also have emotions, you're a human being, and we need to be aware of them first, and then we need to challenge some of them to see if they're valid emotions to have here, or are they not, that's when a lot of breakthroughs happen. So the way I like to say it is to most of these guys, they say, these guys and gals, they have a certain goal, they have a certain blueprint, they think about it all the time, they dream about it, they write it down, they plan it out, they think they really want it, but they're actually more connected to something else. So they think they want this thing, but subconsciously, they're more connected to something else. And that's what usually wins out. And nine times out of 10, that thing is usually a fear. It's not a fear of spiders or heights, but it's a fear of having a certain feeling they want to avoid. And that's what I key in on. Because once you can figure that out and resolve it, they really go to the next level. I would imagine with a lot of these people, especially people that are in the limelight a lot, it's a fear of looking stupid, a fear of leading an organization down this path that might be bad. Yeah. The way I've seen it, there's three main core fears that affect everybody in various levels, but one of them usually sticks out. Happy to share with you. Yeah, but please one of do. Them is absolutely along those lines. Cool. So the first core fear is a fear of uncertainty or powerlessness. Now, what's important to recognize about all these core fears is that we developed them about 100,000 years ago. They're <laughs> in our primal part of our brain, the amygdala, and they served us amazingly well to help us survive. You, you're saying it about yeah, right now that we can don't try help to us actually go. You're, you're telling us right now that we can try to talk ourselves out of these fears. We could try to talk ourselves around them, but they're so much older than us that there's no way in hell we're going to do that. I don't think that's true. Oh, good. I okay. think if they stay there on a subconscious level, they will blindside you and they will win out. Uh, However, if you can flush them out and get them to a conscious level, then you can be aware of it. Think of it as like a football analogy. If you see somebody running down the field and they get completely blindsided, they're going to get knocked down. But if they're anticipating the hit, they can put in a shoulder, they can stiff arm, whatever they may do, then they can win. Carl Jung said it really well. He said that until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you'll call it fate. And for me, what you're saying, the biggest impact is helping making these things to a conscious level. Because all of a sudden, you're not a victim that's getting blindsided by their emotions without understanding what's going on. You can actually say, okay, this is happening to me. This is the fear that I'm feeling. And this is why I feel compelled to take an action that doesn't serve me. But should I? And all of a sudden, when you get into that position of power, it's a whole different ballgame. That's powerful. And so I'm sorry, and I completely derailed you. You've got three of them that are our core fears. Cool. So fear number one is a fear of uncertainty and powerlessness. This is, I feel terrified to feel out of control, that I'm not capable of controlling everything. This is a lot there of people is. end up micromanaging and being the bottleneck. And if you've ever been called the control freak, that's probably why. Now, the reality is that's perfectly valid to want to take control and ownership over your success. But when it comes to an illogical point, where you're just bottlenecking everything and you're micromanaging things that don't need to be micromanaging, then you're not doing something that actually serves you. You're just feeding that emotional fear. So that's fear number one. Fear number two is a fear of worthlessness. This is who am I to, or I'm not good enough, or I need to have this or that before. I need to have a certain accolade, a certain achievement, a certain sense to validate me. This is a lot of times a fear of failure or a fear of success even. Like, am I worthy of that success? I'm sure you see there's a lot of money. Yeah. People are like, do I deserve to have that much money? Is that okay? Sometimes it's perfectionism or imposter syndrome or people putting glass ceilings on themselves. Yeah. And it's just a lot of times this comes from someone's childhood or an early failure. Like this is something that this is the core fear for me that hits the most because I had that one failure that I talked about in the special forces earlier. 
Yeah. And for me, that's still something that I got to recognize. If I'm not conscious of it, it could derail me. So that's fear number two. And fear number three, and this is the fear that whenever I talk to big groups, nobody wants to admit they have, but they all do. We all do. <laughs> right. It's that fear of abandonment. Oh. It's that what happens if he or she or they leave me? Or I can't do this because of what they might say. Like how you're saying this fear of what will people think if I derail the company? And the weird thing with this fear of abandonment is that most often than not, people don't actually have a specific person in mind. They're not saying, oh, what will Joe think about me if I do this action? It's this ominous they, this fear of the tribe, that if we get abandoned in the savannas, uh, we're probably going to be left for dead. So we abandon the things that we know we should be doing so that other people won't abandon us. And those are the kind of three main core fears that I see really affecting people. I feel like throughout my career, I felt all of those. Like as you're walking through those, I think about all kinds of times. I, I often think about, you know, if I'm standing on a stage in front of an audience, what if I lose the audience? And you're right, it's not a them, it's not a specific person. And it isn't even that audience. It's what if that audience tells other audiences how yeah. bad I sucked, right? And it's this thing that's way bigger in my head than it will ever possibly get. I mean, there's, there's no way that my fear will actually ever become realized on that level. And yet it holds us back from, from so much. And I feel like when you talked about this imposter syndrome thing, I want to dive into that a little bit because often, you know, social media, as you know, helps us compare ourselves to other people so often. And it's so, it's frustrating. Yeah. It's frustrating. Number one, I'm frustrated with myself that I do it. Number two, it's frustrating that we have the ability to supposedly see into other people. And we all know it's a lie, right? I mean, deep down, you know, people are only showing you their best foot forward. They're not going to show you their deepest, darkest times. But I look at people and I think he or she is achieving way more than I am. They're getting all these things that I really want. And I feel like my skill set's better. Like I look at the fact that I'm 55 years old. I've done all these things in my career. And yet I look at some 25 year old with 2 million followers on TikTok, and I go, damn it. I could, I could totally, could totally do that. I feel like we have these barriers holding ourselves back. How, how did the special forces train you? And now you train other people to kind of push through these barriers we make for ourselves so we can get this peak achievement out. It's a great question. Truthfully, the special forces did not train me in this way. And the special forces, you don't need to really train in this way because the threat is so obvious in front of you. If someone's shooting at you, you're going to shoot back. The agency, it's a bit of a different life because there's a lot of lulls. You're just basically undercover in a different country for a prolonged amount of time. So it's a very different thing. There you have to be much more aware of your mindset because it's not just a quick action and you're back to base or whatever it may be. The way I would answer your question as far as how to actually overcome these things, these fears that I feel imposter syndrome, let me ask you this. Is it a fear or is it a frustration? What's going on there when you see the person that has 2 million followers? Oh, I think it's a frustration of myself. And it's not that I want 2 million followers either. I mean, I, I, I truly don't care about that. I just look at somebody who's making dumb videos online. And I'm like, I have a skill set that where I can do that. And I can do so much more. Like there's so much I can bring to the world. And I feel like, you know, you're not bringing it. And I'm just using myself as an example. I know everybody driving down the road, listening to us, that they've got this going on in the background too. There's somebody in the office, Itamar, who they're looking at, who is succeeding way bigger than they are. They're not getting where they want to go. And the other person is. What I would ask you and them is to ask themselves, what belief do I possibly hold that's constraining my ability to actualize that skill set? So for example, that person who has a lower skill set than me, they're not holding themselves back. They're maximizing their skill set. Think of a skill set as a vault. Even if there's a million dollars in the vault, but you can only access 20% of it, that's what it is. If that person has a vault of only 400,000, they have a much lower skill set, but they can access all of it, they're going to be winning. So the main thing I like to look at is what's the constraint here? Why aren't you able to access it? Why are you afraid to perhaps speak to your boss about the thing you need to speak about? Perhaps try to give it your all on this project and put yourself in a position to swing big and possibly fail. What are the reasons that you're not actualizing all that skill set, but you're only accessing a little bit of it? Do you have some fear around failure, like you said? Or are you thinking imposter syndrome is basically you're saying, I don't think I'm good enough. I know logically that I have the skill set, but I don't feel 
like I'm good enough. So I'm going to go for small things because I feel confident that I can achieve those small things. And that's the thing. If you can break that barrier, that glass ceiling of what you feel you should be doing, which is probably associated to some fear and some belief that you have about yourself or how you interact with the world, that's when you can access all that vault. Does that make sense? It does. And, and I'm also thinking as you're talking that just by putting these little smaller goals into action, that movement creates more action. Like I got to believe that on your missions, you've got these little tiny things. And once you're in motion, you tend to stay in motion. It's beyond that. It's just an understanding that this is doable. I think the reason most people don't go for the big things because they don't truly believe that they can accomplish it on a high level. Yeah. They have some kind of voice. They say in their imposter syndrome, like, you're not good enough. You can't do it. Well, if you can't do it, if you should be able to do it, why haven't you done it yet? And the moment you can break that facade and actually recognize, you know, this is achievable for me. There's no reason if I have this skill set, I should be able to do it. Once you create that internal belief and recognize there's no reason for me not to believe it, that's when I've seen people being able to go and myself as well. So when I was going out on the, in those missions in various countries, I had complete faith that I could carry out whatever I needed to carry out. And it wasn't that I needed something to push me. It was that there was a vacuum of self-doubt. There wasn't any self-doubt there. And that's what really helped me propel forward. It's a bit different answer, but does it make sense? No, it totally does. And that actually leads into what I think is going to be my last question, which I know is going to be a long one. You wrote me that you have a six-step process to help people break through that, to get to that full potential that they have. But before we get to that, I've been thinking all along, Itamar, that there are people screaming at their devices into their headphones right now. Why haven't you asked them about this? Which is this. So <laughs> you've got this guy at the gym. I just need to go back to this. You got this guy at the gym. You find out that he's trying to kidnap you. Like there must have been something finally that set you off. Like what was the little clue yeah. that you got? What was the thing that made you go, oh my God, this isn't what I thought it was? Yeah. So I'll, I'll kind of rewind the story. So when you're an undercover agent abroad, you do keep a cover, but you're not expected to just be holed up in your room eating rice and not having any kind of social life whatsoever. Sure. There's certain boundaries. You can never obviously tell people why you're there, what you're doing. You can't have anybody ever come to your house or know where you live. You got to make sure you're not being followed, but you can go out to restaurants. You can go out to the gym to work out and you can make very, let's call it shallow social acquaintances. Yeah. But you got to make sure that you never have a pattern they can follow. So this person, I met him at the gold gym and I would be hitting the heavy bags and he was also hitting the heavy bags, kickboxing. And eventually we'd meet up in spar sometimes and we'd we swap phone numbers and I would always dictate when we would meet up and how it would happen. He would sometimes offer me, hey, why don't I give you a ride back to your place or do you want to come with me and my friends to eat? And I would always say no. I'd always make sure I wasn't being followed. I would take my own path. So what happened, this was in 2010. It was the FIFA Soccer World Cup. And it was during the semifinals, during halftime, he gave me a call. And he said, hey, Damar, is there any chance that me and my friend could come watch the game at your place? Our TV just broke. We're really desperate to see the second half. I said, no. I mean, that's a weird question. But the cultural differences in Mumbai were like that, where people were, would allow themselves to interject in a more free manner. I said, no. You can watch the game. There's a sports bar next to the Golds. Why don't you go over there? Enjoy. Maybe I'll call you next week. We can meet up in Spar. He says, oh, okay. He calls me again after a couple minutes and he says, Edomar, they're not showing the game at the sports bar at the Elba Room. Can we please watch the game at your place? We're really desperate to see it. And I said, no. And it was weird. But I said, no, I'll see you next week. Hope you guys figure it out. He's like, oh, Edomar, please. We're really, really desperate to see the game. We're right beneath your house anyway. And I was like, how do you know where I live? Right. There it is. Because there was absolutely no way where you should have known where I live. And as soon as I said that, like, I remember the hairs in the back of my neck standing up and my flatmate, who was also an agent, figured out that something was up. In a moment, I just, I looked at the phone and I said to it, so, okay, here's the deal. You know who I am and now I know who you are. The call is yours. Basically, like you blew your cover. You understood who I am and you blew your cover by doing that. So basically, we got our equipment on within a couple of days. I was out of the country you told and the guy on the call. Local Mossad Wait a minute, hold on. You told the guy on the call. You said, you said, I know who you are. Yeah. You know who I am. This is obvious now. And I know who you are as well. Because the reason was that I want to create a deterrent. So he didn't think I was a vulnerable target anymore. Because what he was trying to do was trying to catch me off guard. Yeah. It was hung up. Oh. That was okay. it. It was hung yeah. up. We called our I called my superior as well. And like we got some police involved, and that was kind of it. Within a couple of days, I was out of the country. And our Mossad attache confirmed with the IBI, which is the local Indian FBI, 
that it was indeed an Al-Qaeda cell. They had picked up the trace of my predecessor in Mumbai. He was also a big white guy, for lack of better terms, in the middle of Mumbai, and he didn't keep his cover and identity as sealed as he should. So when they saw me replacing him, they just figured out, okay, this is the next guy that's in this role, and that's what it was. Wow. I had to hear the end of that story, but now, but now, thank you so much. What's the six step process we use to push through this self doubt? Because I got to believe even in moments like that, man, there's a ton of self doubt. Like, am I going to get out of this country? But for us, these, the six step process to get the unblock happening. So it's an interesting way you phrase it. Cause truthfully, that's not the process that I would have used then because there you have no choice. I think the real challenge is when we don't have a choice, when we have to do something, we're going to find a way to do it. Like if, for example, the example of a mother lifting a car off her kid, she's not going through any process. Adrenaline's just pumping through her veins. She's going to do it. The real problem is that sometimes we don't have to do something. Our back isn't against the wall, so we settle in mediocrity instead of going for something really great with our finances, with our career, whatever it may be. And when we have the option to not do something great, that's when I think this process is phenomenal. So the first step in the process is getting really clear on what you actually want. Not what you want just from a surface level goals perspective, but inverse thinking about that saying, well, the reason I want these goals is because I probably want to feel a certain way, whether that's accomplished, whether that's proud. So let me flip that around. Let me say, how do I actually want to feel in the world and about myself? And therefore, what do I need to accomplish in order for that to be a reality? That's step one. Step two is then figuring out if somebody were to achieve that, those goals that I just said, what would they need to value? Forget about what are my top values, but what would they need to value in order to achieve that? And then you break down those values into very clear and tangible rules. You say, if I need to value more courage, or I need to value more audacity, or more strategic thinking, what are specific rules that I could live by on a day-to-day or week-by-week basis that would indeed prove, okay, this is a person who's acting with courage? So that's step two. Step three is when we start incorporating the human factor. We say, okay, you're clear on what you want to do, you're clear on how to do it, but what subconscious fears could get in your way? And that's when you got to flush out your subconscious and figure out what belief structures that I hold that would be stopping me from doing this specific thing. Because if you can figure that out, you're already way ahead of the game. When we talked about the whole making the unconscious conscious so it doesn't blindside you, all of a sudden, you're not going to be just blindsided and, and wrecked around not doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's step three. Step four, you falsify those things. Like I'm not a fan of the whole jargon of limiting beliefs, negative beliefs, positive beliefs. There's just false beliefs and truth. If something's a false belief and you're a logical individual, you will decide, you know what? I'm going to let this go. Even though it doesn't feel comfortable, I will follow what's true. For example, my process, the one that I had to go through, I had a belief that anybody who's not Israeli, what I developed subconsciously without recognizing that anybody who's not Israeli is going to try to harm me because that was something that I experienced with that Al-Qaeda attempt. Now, for me, I had to recognize, oh, this is something that is, this is a story I'm telling myself in my head. This is a belief that I hold. Yeah. And I had to recognize that also that's not true. It's not that anybody who's not Israeli is going to harm me. It was still challenging for me to start making new friends and new acquaintances with people that are outside of the country afterwards. But I did that because I knew I can't just fall into these old patterns. I can't be victim to that. I have the power of choice now. I falsified it and that gave me that. That's step four. Step five is saying, okay, what do I need to remove from my life in a very honest perspective? I'm a big fan of looking at this from a place of humility. I am not Superman. I can't take everybody and anybody on my back, especially if they don't want to go up the mountain. So if we're not heading in the same direction, some people need to be left. Like It's not a fit. Me trying to go in a certain way and trying to force them to go with me, no one's happy. I think for a lot of people, that's the difficult one, like removing this stuff. I mean, there's two things. There's some tough conversations here. But number two, there's this warm blanket feeling you get at night, you know, when the air's cold and it just, and, and you, you got these friendships that are much more, you've had them for so long that getting rid of it is a difficult, but, I mean, we may logically know we need it, but man, can this one be tough? Yeah, I think it's extremely tough when you're not clear on what you want for yourself. People ask me sometimes, how do I have a hard conversation with someone? And I say, the first thing is you have to have a hard conversation with yourself. And the key to doing that is to be actually clear on what you really want. Because once you're really clear on what you want, you can say, is this a fit or not? Not is this a bad person, good person, but is this a fit for what I want? While those things may be comforting, again, it depends what you value. If you value comfort or if you value growth and you value your own personal stuff, it's different. And that's for everyone to decide. 
The last thing, step six, is just evolution. What usually happens is that after you figure out what you really want, you figure out a roadmap to get there, and you rem- you flush out and then falsify the internal blockers that would stop you from achieving that. Yeah. And you remove a lot of the weight from relationships that don't serve you. All of a sudden, you think differently. You're a lot more free, and you set a new target. And it's kind of it's not this loop that ends, but it's this upward spiral. And that's the way I've seen it go, which is really amazing to see. People just keep evolving. And now they have a toolkit to keep evolving. That's fantastic. And I love this evolution, that it doesn't end. It's this continual evolutionary process into, into greatness we didn't know was inside of us. I know, Itamar, that you have, you and, you and your consultancy, you have, a, you have a cool program called The Arena. Can we talk about The Arena for just a second? I like the name of that. I feel like it's, is it, is it named after like the man in the arena, the Theodore Roosevelt Correct. Yeah, Correct. fantastic. Because I love that analogy. But tell us about the arena and how people can maybe get more coaching from you if they want to go to the next level. Happy to. So the arena, it follows that six-step process. Like I said, it's a six-week program. It's very intense. It's workshops at the beginning of the week with me and Q and A's at the beginning at the end of the week with me. Where every week we follow one of the pillars, so we get really clear on what you want, figure out the roadmap, and then remove anything that's getting in your way from accomplishing that. It's small groups, so everybody gets personal attention. It's a premium program. It's got a premium price. And as far as I know, it's pretty much the only program in the industry that has 100% money back guarantee. Like We help winners win, and we only let people into the program who we think we can win. It's something that I love doing, and I'm very grateful I get to do these days. And you can find out how to apply at edomarmani.com slash apply. But please let us know that you came from the Stacking Benjamins podcast. And that'd be awesome if you did, everybody. Let uh, Itamar and his team know that we sent you, his mom said, we sent you. And that we're not Al-Qaeda agents either. We can say that. (laughs) That would be appreciated if you mentioned that. (laughs) Man, I hope not. Yes. Uh, And by the way, if you are on your commute today or you're walking the dog, whatever, we've got you covered. We'll have a link to Itamar Marani's site and how to apply on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Itamar, thank you so much for all of your insights. This has been incredibly enlightening. I think we helped a lot of people today. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on, Joe. Thank you very much. This is Matt from Gainesville, Georgia. And when I'm not delivering all this consumerism in a big brown package parcel, I'm stacking Benjamins. Man, how about that kidnapping story? Unreal. People wonder, how come I have a bag on my head sometimes? <laughs> Because <laughs> we're holding him hostage here. Not that. I just can't afford to be kidnapped. An important commodity around here. I thought you were insinuating that the real reason we're in mom's basement is we only take the bag off when when the camera's no, gone. because I was thinking, hey, you know. Hey, speak to that camera and tell a bunch of financial facts for the Dave next Dave Ramsey's hour. like, hey, so would you like to come out and play? I'm like, I don't think I'm allowed. Because <laughs> Dave Ramsey wants to meet on his show. He's going to kidnap me. For <laughs> Dave's standing on your sidewalk right now. I know. Hey, Dave, you know who I am, yeah. and I know who you Let's are. Let's get it on, Dave. <laughs> we about to throw hammers. I'll get all my credit cards out. What are you going to do now, Dave? <laughs> Can't imagine. Like his kryptonite. We will have not only links to Itamar's coaching, but also more in the show notes. And in our 201, by the way, what a motivational interview that is. We have cultivated five of our most motivational interviews that we've done in five different areas. And you can either search back through the 1600 plus episodes to just go find those yourself and listen to the entire shows. Or we have just those five interviews isolated in a YouTube clip. If you just go to. Hold on, Joe. Do we want to give them the answer like that? Shouldn't we just have them go listen to the 16? That's more downloads for us. Have them go back and listen to the the 1600 (laughs) episodes or the 3500 episodes. Maybe we're not great marketers. Maybe we're just in this to help people get better. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Stackybenjamins.com slash motivate. That's stackybenjamins.com slash motivate. Not only, by the way, will we share these five with you, you'll also then also have a chance to sign up for our 201 newsletter there if you already don't get it, because motivation is not just one time, it is an ongoing thing. You got to keep yourself, got to keep yourself going. Oh, gee, as Itamar said so eloquently. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, OG, they put what you value first. Uh, golf season. Golf, golf, and extra golf. That's kind of my, my focus for the month of uh, June. 
I get that handicap. You down. like golfing in that 140 degree dry Texas grass where your ball rolls like 90 yards, even on a duffed nine iron. Yeah. yeah. That's what you like. That's good. I don't hit duff nine irons, but I can imagine what it'd be like if I did. Uh huh. It's your loved ones in your time, which is even better on a golf course. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simply go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote. At Haven Life, their application is simple. It's online. You get instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable, and they're issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 140-year-old insurer. Greg wrote us an email, said that he's a little uh, camera shy. So, unfortunately, Greg, we can't send you some Stacky Benjamin swag because you didn't call in. But here is Greg's question. So, my question is in regard to how I should be saving for a house in the future. My current housing, including utilities, provided by my employer, I currently pay myself, quote, rent into a simple savings account, but I'd like to see this money work for me. Suggestions on where I should be putting it. Hope to hear back. Thanks, Greg. Greg, of course, we got your back. And uh, where should he be putting that house money? It's in a savings account now. Maybe a syndication hands it to this guy. Sounds like Greg's a Masada. Real estate syndication deal would be one place. (laughs) You'll double your money in three years or not. (laughs) Or not. One of the two. I think it all just boils down to when do you want the money? If you don't have a determined time frame, I need to buy a house in this period of time, then I would totally have it be invested. But if you're looking at a time horizon and you say, well, my, my employer pays for my housing, but I need to get one on my own, and I think I'm going to need a house in three years, or I want to buy a house in three years, then anything under five years has to be pretty safe and secure. The downside is that every time you look at the stock market, you're going to be like, gosh, darn it, I should have invested this this thing and it would have gone up. Except for the fact that if you would invest the money, then it's going to go down because that's how Murphy's (laughs) Law works. So general rule, uh, (laughs) you know, anything under five years, safe and secure, everything above five years invested in the great companies in the United States and the world and uh, and and just let it let it go and see what happens. The odds are in your favor on that longer time horizon for sure. Two things I think, OG, that he looks at versus a simple savings account. There are money market accounts like Navy Federal has. As an example, if he is in the military, I know using a uh, money market can give him a higher interest rate and he still keeps some insurance on that money. More. Yep. Yeah. And it's not going to be a ton, but I think it's a better place. And the second thing is, and man, we've been able to say this, OG, for a long time, but if he knows specifically when he needs it, a CD might be worth looking at again now. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If you've got it, all of those things would be fine, right? Savings, money market, CD, uh, treasury bonds, you know, something that's going to have a known outcome over a relatively short period of time. So I like all of those things. I, I, I want to stay away from, you know, stock ownership if you need the money in the next three to five years. Thanks for that question, Greg. If you call us though, next time, Greg, stackybedjamins.com slash voicemail, We will send you a Greatest Money Show on Earth, Haven Life, Stacking Benjamins t-shirt with our circus theme to embrace the fact that we've got quite a variety show going on here with all kinds of high wire acts like uh, Doug is trying to apparently do here. with. uh, Since we're budgeted to give away a t-shirt every week and Greg didn't leave a voicemail, that t-shirt has to go somewhere. I think that's the rule. I think the rule is we don't send one that week. We budget for like 45 out of 52 because there's always a Greg who needs help that we just can't can't get to. scratcher. Hey, I know that this is a valuable time for all of you. Uh, So thank you for choosing to spend it with us. Thank you for people that have left us a review. You know, I haven't said this in a little while, but... And this is not why we'd like people to give us a review. We we like reviews mostly because people wonder what the show's actually really about. And if you do and you send it to me, we will send you out one of these many books that I get from all the different authors. Uh, Itamar, not an author, so he doesn't... Man, if that guy had a book, that'd be an amazing book. But uh, I get these to review and to prep, and I just don't have room for them all. So some of these authors have fantastic work. Don't leave us a review because you want a book, but certainly if you do, send me an email, joe at stackybedjamins.com. Tell me what the review was, and I'll be happy to put your name in the hat. And lately, by the way, I've been giving everybody a book because we've just had so many great authors on. So send those to me, and thank you for people's patience for the times when I've been traveling around the country, because sometimes it's taken me a few weeks, he said to Julie in uh, Vermont specifically. So... Thanks to Julie for hanging out and waiting, but we made it worth her while. Coming up on our community calendar this week, tonight, I've got an Instagram live with Carl Brower from IC Cars. Every time I talk to 
Carl Brower. He's got something interesting, a new stat about what's going on in the car market. And in this one, he's going to be revealing their research on high mileage cars, which brands of cars tend to last the longest. So if you're in the used car market, you may want to focus on brands where the cars are likely to still be around 200,000, 250,000 miles and, and beyond. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific uh, on Instagram this evening. Much more if you want more, stackybenjamins.com slash welcome for all the different places to hang out with us. All right. If you're not here to hang out, you're not here for used car <laughs> outlook. You're here because you're frustrated that you're not making decisions as well as you know you can with your money. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash OG. That's how you book time on OG and his team's calendar to see how his team can help you make better financial decisions that the future you will thank you for at stackybenjamins.com slash OG. All right. That is it for us. Doug, you got it from here, man. Lots of takeaways, but what should we have learned on today's show? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from Itamar and build your mental fortitude to stop holding yourself back. Second, from our TikTok, if it sounds too good to be true, probably is. But the big lesson, I've been had. Turns out Joe's mom has two-timed me. She's like a double agent. She never wanted to spend quality time in the kitchen. It was all just a ruse to get free labor to make dinner. Of all the low, down, dirty tricks, she knew I wanted that recipe all along. Thanks for toying with me, lady. And no, I'm not cleaning that cupboard after we record. What? Okay, maybe I'll clean half of it. What? You'll what? Got it. Okay, yep, clean it all. I'll clean it all. Thanks to Itamar for joining us today. You can find out more about his podcast, The Emotional Fortitude Podcast, wherever you're listening to us right now. Also, we'll have a special link for his course just for all the stackers. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lacey Langford, who's also the host of The Military Money Show, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. We insinuated at the top of the show that there may have been some problems that occurred with OG's grill. Insinuated. That sounds like it sounds like something caught a flame. <laughs> did something catch a flame? Did your grill catch on fire? 
No. Besides your ire? No, I mean, it's a grill, so it's supposed to be on fire, but yes. it's not supposed to be on fire for the entire day. Well, I don't know. I remember we had our swim team over for a cookout back when my kids were in high school. And so we're doing tons of hamburgers and hot dogs on this grill. And it was an older grill. And oh, gee, there's your grill, which is supposed to have fire. And there is your grill catching fire. Yes. And my grill caught fire. Flame broiled, yeah, that's, as it were. Yeah, but it was, they, were, they were well done. Yes. Lots of well done burgers. And we had to keep calming the fire down. Oh, uh, a little high fat content in those Costco burgers, those frozen Costco burgers that you bought. No, low, low fat content. Oh, you're doing them though for 60. We were doing 60 burgers. I should have oh, known yeah. on my no, little I home. You get the frozen ones, you throw those babies on there, yeah. and it's just everything's fire everywhere. They come out like a hockey puck. Oh, yeah. You're like, here's your burger. Yeah. Like, wasn't this thing like a nice, nice pressed quarter pounder? The first half was no. fine. It was once I got about halfway through that my grill goes, yeah, we're done. But that's not what happened to yours. So apparently your relatives uh, who were visiting came over and used the grill, which is great. How did the grill incident happen? We were out of town for a day. We left. We were gone for 18 hours. We just were like, we, we boogied out of but town. But the relatives stayed behind. Yeah, I do have children. So we didn't invite them. We actually went and saw Garth Brooks in residence in Las Vegas. Wow. At... Caesars, which was really cool. Super, super, super cool. Very uh, tiny auditorium, uh, maybe 3,000, 4,000 people. And he started about 8 o'clock and finished about 11. Holy No breaks, moly. no halftime. Holy cow. Just a uh, really awesome storyteller. And he oozed gratefulness for having had a career as successful as his was. And I, I didn't write, I, this is going to sound silly, I didn't recognize a lot of his stuff when he was talking about it, but then he would sing and you'd go, Oh, I, I know that song. I've heard that, you know, whatever. Cause I mean, it's been around a long time. So yeah, we went to Vegas for a day and um, came back the next day and we're, you know, hanging out by the pool. It's a million degrees. And my wife's like, I kind of, I've been smelling gas. You guys smell gas. And everybody says, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We've been smelling it. And as she says that I kind of turn my head and I can see the grill from where I'm sitting and I can see that the, there's the waves, temp the temperature. No, I can see the temperature Satan thing is rising from the grill. I can see the temperature is there is a temperature. It's not zero like it would be. And I just kind of put my head down. I was just like, this is on brand. And this isn't just like a little hibachi grill that you got at uh, Walmart. I mean, uh, no, 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 I didn't buy it at Walmart. It was um, this is a built in. There's uh, a comma in the number, isn't there? Yes, maybe there's two. a comma for sure. <laughs> No, there's no two. There's not two commas. No, <laughs> two commas. no million. <laughs> there's four commas. It's plumbed into the house, so there's no hope that the tank ran dry. Oh, geez, new grill uh, installation is part of the debt deal. <laughs> yes, yes. But more, more interestingly, so it's got you know, I, I don't know, like a grill is a grill, right? Like you got everybody's used a grill before, and you you can pretty much they're ubiquitous. You go, I turn the gas on and I press the button and light it, right? Like yeah. you just. You know, but this one has a different way of lighting it and a different way of heating it. It's supposed to go in a certain order when it has directions of like, and this is how you're supposed to light and heat this grill. I imagine there's a reason for it. And uh, one of the things it has is an automatic lighting system that it's like a glow plug for if you, you know, think about like a diesel engine or diesel something engine. like that. And so, you know, Doug has a different definition of a go plug. But anyway, not a go glow plug. plug. A glow and yes, plug. I do. Oh, glow plug. Yeah. Well, he's yeah. got different definitions of that, especially. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. Mine uses C batteries. You know, so you got to do it the right way. And I and I said something to Alyssa. I said, just let's just not let him use it. Like you don't even do it correctly. I get frustrated when she doesn't do it. I just it's 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 just you got to learn how to do it. I mean, Joe, you stayed at my house and I gave you instructions on how to start the grill, didn't I? Yes. I was like, this. I know you're going to use the grill. This is how you do it. And Doug, guess how many times I used the grill after those instructions? Zero. Zero. But you also didn't tell him about the no. Cameras you used the, the grill because there was chicken chicken marks all over it. I could tell. I can tell who uses the grill because I leave it pristine. No, I'm kidding. Anyways. The long and the short of it is that there's wires in the grill, you know, like in every grill. And it turns out uh, when you have it on for 24 hours, it gets very hot inside. What? Um, bonus, huh. all of the charcoal was burned yeah, off. Self-cleaning. You know, all the, all the oh. leftover food. So it's it actually self -cleaning. cleaned it. It's kind of, sort of. That's how your in-laws needed to re-pitch that. <laughs> Cleaned your grill for you. So you're more than welcome to come over. Just keep your hands off my grill. Cautionary tale about having relatives, peeps. <laughs>